episode of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. If you are new to the podcast, thank you for joining us. This is a podcast about leadership, culture, sports, entrepreneurship. We talk about it all. When I say we, I'm talking about myself. I am Colin and my co-host, Jamie. We are the two hosts of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Uh, Check us out social media. We have a website, talent409.com. You can check out the podcast there too. So a lot of ways to find us and leave reviews and leave feedback, whatever you want to do. We'll take all of that in. But Jamie, we are going to lead into our first segment for this week, which is one big win. I know you have a lot going on, so I'm sure you could choose from a lot of wins, but why don't you tell us uh, what your one big win is for this week? Thanks. Yeah. Happy to leave this off here. Um, You're right. I have a ton going on, but I think my biggest win of the week um, was I just confirmed that I will be donating two of my board and train programs to two auctions. I made it a goal when I started the company to give back and I gave a board and train to an auction for LLS earlier in the year. And then two more opportunities came up to do something similar. So my goal is to do four donated board and trains a year. So once a quarter, um, and I just secured two more. So that'll be three for the year. So I'm really excited. One is for lung cancer research and one is for the Humane Society of Charlotte. So I'm going to try to do two for pets and um, two kind of more going back towards people. So I'm really excited about those. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. How do you go about like identifying who you want to support like in that endeavor like is there an an elimination process you go through or how does how does that happen for you well the first one came kind of naturally my mom asked about it she has a friend that she goes to orange theory fitness with that was raising money for leukemia and lymphoma and i have a younger cousin who had lymphoma a few years ago he's now fine recovered um graduated valedictorian of his class even with going through cancer treatment but um (laughs) That is a cause that was already, you know, near and dear to my heart because of my cousin. So I was happy to donate one of those. And then it was a former client of mine that asked for the Lung Cancer Society. And um, and then, of course, the Humane Society of Charlotte. I follow all the rescues. So I saw they did kind of a call out for people to donate auction items. Um, so that's how I went about that one. Very cool. But, um, yeah. And then I'm, I'm pretty open minded as far as causes. So. Um, in the future, I hope I can kind of get back to a bunch of different causes and different rescues, especially in the Charlotte area. Yeah. Well, if you ever need it, more reason to check out Jamie's business. Here's more of a reason. She's a really great person. So <laughs> you should definitely support her. I say this every week, go check out her business. It's right in the show notes. Take a break from what you're doing. Just click on the link and give her a follow on Instagram. You can at least see the cute little puppies that she has all the time. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Uh, my big win for the week, Jamie, I've been trying to decide which one I want to go with. I'm going to recycle one that I used last week because it just happened today. So I'm feeling pretty, you know, energized and (laughs) I'm both energized and like exhausted right now from it, uh, which, which I guess is a a good feeling. Um, but I, I finally had a, a workshop, Uh, earlier for um, one of the college teams that I'm working with here in the Charlotte area. First time in a long time uh, because of COVID and everything else. And I was definitely a little bit nervous, but I think the girls really did enjoy the session. I mean, they were super, you know, interactive with me asking questions, giving suggestions and kind of talking through the material that we went through. So I feel pretty good coming out of it that I made a good impact, which is a nice feeling, but I also am just, like I said, I'm, I'm exhausted. I, I have a ton of energy too. I don't know how that makes sense, but I'm feeling like really good. Um, having actually done some of the work in person again, uh, versus, you know, it's just been all virtual. And even if we could do virtual, it's just been really hard. And, um, so I know things aren't, uh, you know, totally out of the clear yet, but I'm going to keep doing what I can and take advantage of those opportunities. Cause I, I like this feeling. So hopefully there's more to come. Yeah, that's super exciting. And been a very long time coming and it sounds like that adrenaline is kicking in. So that's a very, <laughs> very fun, nice feeling. 
yeah, the adrenaline's kicking in and out. That's probably (laughs) what's happening here. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, let's get into our lead in segment then uh, before our featured guest conversation, which today is with Megan Bunning. Uh, Megan is a performance coach, uh, coaches the coaches at Florida State University. Uh, she has a cool little program down there. That information's in the show notes, so definitely check that out. And what I wanted to talk about with you, Jamie, is something that Megan had brought up in the conversation with me and how you really can't help uh, you know, other people be their best versions of themselves unless you yourself are already your best self. And yeah, I think we've talked about this in, uh, I think, a number of different ways, probably to this point already. But today, I wanted to get a little bit more specific and just talk about, you know, maybe what are some of those key items you know, on a day to day basis? Like if we had to draw out a checklist to say, all right, in order for me to be the best version of myself, this is what I have to do. And this is how it has to be in order for me to make that impact. And so I'll go first, uh, since you went first for um, the big win for the week. I think the areas that give me the most energy, which is, you know, for me, the energy to get through, like, I'm the type of person that doesn't want to just go through the motions on a day to day basis. So like, I, I tell people all the time, like, I always show up. And what I mean by I show up is like, I have an energy that I try to bring with me all the time. And obviously that can get pretty exhausting if you're, you know, on all the time. And so you have to learn how to manage it and everything. And so one of the ways that my energy can get managed throughout the day uh, is by a couple of things, uh, making sure my workout comes first thing in the morning. That gets me like really the, the adrenaline gets pumping. You know, I, I, the blood gets flowing from a good night's sleep and everything. And that really catapults me for, I don't know, roughly like five, six hours where, you know, I'm just like, all right, ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. Um, you know, I think meditation really helps uh, just kind of calm some of the nerves because I am kind of a high strung person that I tend to have a lot like on my to-do list every single day. And there's a lot that I want to accomplish and a lot of people that I want to talk to every single day. Um, and so meditation helps <laughs> bring me back centered a little bit more, just calm me, relax me a little bit. I found that that has been helpful to uh, level me out and allow me to uh, use that energy, I guess, over a longer course of the day. Um, Whereas like in the past, I had burnt out like a little bit earlier, if that makes sense. Um, I don't get to do this on a day-to-day basis, but whenever I can sneak sneak in, excuse me, a power nap, uh, that certainly helps me <laughs> be the best version of myself. Um, so you know, even 10, 20 minutes, that, that can usually do the trick. Uh, and then I think the other uh, big things are uh, water intake and, um, you know, really what I'm eating. Um, what I'm eating kind of affects like my mood and how I'm feeling. And I know like literally almost all of this stuff that I just talked about is like health and fitness related. But like for me, at least personally, that's how important those things are to me being the best, best version of myself. Um, and, and if I don't do those things, I mean, I, I take rest days and, you know, I, I love desserts as I've talked about on this podcast before I have a huge sweet tooth. And so it's not like I'm perfect all the time, but if I'm more consistently doing, you know, four out of four, three out of four, you know, whatever it is of those four things that I just talked about, then, you know, for me, that allows me to be the best version of myself. And then I feel like I can, better or best help uh, other people too. Um, how about you? I, I don't know if you're uh, like me and have these health and fitness things that drive you, but what do you think drives you to be the best version of yourself? I wish I could say it was waking up in the morning and working out. I, I aspire, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I can definitely relate to you on a lot of those. I think, you know, just eating well and water intake is really important. I'm also a huge fan of the power napping. I'm often up in the middle of the night with puppies. So that is something that, you know, I don't get to every day, but if I can, I will. And kind of going along with that, um, I found it's really important for me to take time to myself each day, whether that's, you know, taking a walk and listening to a podcast or an audio book, 
I, maybe you can relate to this too, especially in the last year where most of your work has been at home and you're not, you know, out working with teams as much. Everything I do is in my home. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to escape and kind of go somewhere. But even if it's me sitting in my backyard, maybe without any puppies for a minute, it's really, really helpful. So I try to take at least a half hour truly to myself each day just to kind of decompress. Um, and along with that, and usually these kind of go together, but I have to be outside for some portion of the day, um, whether it's walk or run. Um, anytime I'm kind of cooped up inside, I definitely have a harder time kind of getting through my day and staying energized and all of that. So um, those are really my biggest things, um, trying to implement more working out back into my routine. That used to be a big one for me, um, but been kind of struggling to find all the time now. So <laughs> hopefully soon, maybe I should try the mornings um, once pups have been up. But yeah, I think that's, that's really important. And I've noticed having puppies, even before I did my own, it really um, kind of challenging to make time for myself. So I've talked to even some of my newer contractors about that and how they can kind of use these tips. And I think no matter what profession you're in, if you're in a leadership position, even if you're not, you have peers figuring out what works for you and uh, like empathizing with other people that they need it as well. And maybe giving them tips when they're kind of struggling to keep it together can be really helpful. Absolutely. And I love the being outside uh, portion that you threw in there. I think I'm going to steal that as mine too. Cause <laughs> I think I've realized as I've gotten older, like how much just going out for even a small walk or, you know, just being outside in general, like <laughs> it's, it's hard because I, I don't like to sweat and, and, Charlotte, you sweat quite often, um, but I've just found yes. that I, I will just take that second shower uh, every single night, like after I put Stella to bed and just feel, it actually helps me feel refreshed, like for the final two, three hours that I'm up at the night, at night, I'm like, all right, well, um, so <laughs> just a silly thing that I was thinking of when he said go outside, I was like, eh, I don't want to go outside or showered for the day, but it really does help <laughs> energize me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That is very, very true about the uh, sweating and being outside. That's the inconvenient part, but I find it very, very worth it. Yeah, for sure. Definitely worth it. And hopefully you, the listening audience, you can uh, take some of these tips that we passed along today and apply them to your life, or at least start to think about what works for you and how you can be the best version of yourself so that you can better help other people. Even if you're not in a leadership position per se, if you're a parent, uh, if you are caring for an elder uh, loving loved one, uh, whatever the case may be, uh, there's a lot of ways that this can probably help you. But that's going to do it for Jamie and I. Thank you for listening. And let's get into the featured conversation today with Megan Bunning. Okay, everyone. Today I have Dr. Megan Bunning with me. And Megan, I want to start today's conversation with a question. I had seen a quote from you, and I'll read the quote, I'll ask the question. The quote from you says, there are skills you can take to go from being an athlete or a coach that will translate over to other things. And so often on this podcast, we talk about what you learn in athletics and how it can translate into pretty much anything that you do in life. So I'd love to start with maybe identifying what some of those major skills are. I'm sure there's common ones that have come up over the course of your work and conversations with people. So can you first um, help us identify what those skills are when you, when you say something like that? Sure. So I'll start with kind of the common ones that you hear all of the time. I, I think, you know, there's this time management, you learn how to manage your time because you're having to juggle practice and, you know, coming from an athlete's perspective, I can always talk about coaching, but <laughs> I'll stick with the athlete, the athlete time management. There is this uh, organization piece. You have to be, and that kind of falls into time management a little bit, but I see it as different also because you have to learn how to organize your individual tasks so that you can work efficiently, right? But, and then there's, there's a lot of others, but the ones that really hit home to me that I talk a lot about is these things intertwined with communication. And I think the, the biggest, if I was to pick one big lesson out of what I've taken from working in sports and playing, it's how to work with others. 
And I was just having this conversation actually with my 12 year old daughter. She's about to start playing her first team sport, hopefully if she makes the team. And I, you know, she's kind of on the fence about whether to play. And so I was trying to, you know, the mother and former coach and professor and me is getting into this deep conversation with the 12 year old, but (laughs) started talking about, uh, you know, if nothing else, you learn how to work with other people that are very different from you. And it went into these stories about how I had teammates that were from the opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, I was, I grew up in the South and uh, if you hadn't picked up on my accent, that's, you know, I'm Southern grown and we have our ways and we have our culture. And then, uh, you know, there was the religious aspect that I had. There's my upbringing, my core values. And then I had to play on a team that had people from California. That's for a Southerner that can seem like it's from a different country. And I've played and coached with other folks from a different country. And so, you know, there were folks that would I hang out with on the, off the field? No, but I tell you what, when we got on the field, we had to learn how to win and we did. And, uh, you know, so I think that's the biggest thing that's carried over. I have learned how to work with people that are on the opposite ends of the spectrum at times and to take the emotion out of what I do and just get down to the nitty gritty. How can we fit things together? How can we use what you bring to the table, what I bring to the table, where can we meet and do put a successful product on, on the plate? So I would say that's the biggest takeaway and you can break that down into how do you communicate uh, something I mentioned with the emotions. So that's what I would say. I love it. And um, I I jumped the gun a a little bit here uh, in terms of uh, maybe giving the listening audience some background into who you are and what you do. You're a coach at Florida State University, certified mental performance consultant. And um, yeah, I think before we dive a little bit more into your background, you mentioned playing your division one softball player. Uh, what I'd like to go back is to what you talked about in terms of learning how to work with others and not necessarily wanting to even like become best friends with somebody. Right. And just understanding that you're not going to like everybody. Not everybody's going to like you, but in a team concept, you should be able to find maybe those common drivers that help you go toward whatever goal it is that you have. And I think the reason this is interesting to me is because I often see where, you know, that word family is thrown around a lot and teams want to you know, get really close and uh, they want to be best friends. And I, I just don't know. I, I mean, from your research and from your work and even from your playing and coaching experience, like, do you find that you need to act almost as a family or be best friends in order to find success on the field? Or, you know, is it possible to do what you said? And and if it is, how how do we do that? Like, how do we still work with somebody if we don't necessarily want to hang out with them after after a game or practice? (laughs) Sure. So this is interesting because I used to coach for Florida state. That was back in 2000. Um, Oh, oh, four to oh, seven. And since I've gone on to coach other places, now I get to teach coaches at FSU coach interdisciplinary center. And I would say that when I first started coaching, so Florida state was my first coaching position. I was 24, right. I mean, had played a little bit of international and some uh, pro ball, but right off the field. And I think that having that mentality where you're trying to force athletes to, like you said, we need to be a family. We need to all get along and we're going to have our fights and quarrels. And I think that there is some value to that, but I think that the conversation can be a little bit reframed. It's kind of an archaic uh, old school mentality, Megan's words here. <laughs> and because I know a lot of coaches still buy into that. And like I said, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong. I just think we have to re-examine what we're asking the athletes to do. For some, just like when you meet people, there are going to be some people that you immediately click with. And there's this, and this isn't even in research, there's a natural attraction for whatever reason to them. It doesn't have to be physical. It can be intellectual, whatever. You just are on the same wavelength. And then there are others that you know, you meet them and you're like, ah, yeah, okay, nice to meet you, but 
moving on. You know, you just rub, you don't rub the right way. And it's unreasonable for us to think as coaches that, or in any situation that we're going to be on the same wavelength with everybody and that we're not going to uh, not like somebody, right? If we're dealing in a team dynamic. And I think that when you look at coaching a team and getting them to learn how to play as a team, I think you can bring in some elements of the family. Like we, we need to have each other's backs. We need to, uh, you know, kind of pick up. We always hear you're always as strong as your, as your weakest link or your weakest player, you know, whatever. And there is some truth to that. And I think you can get athletes to buy into that, but to have athletes say that we all need to get along and um, that kind of thing. I'm, I don't know that that's realistic. And so when you take them, the, the hard part here is teaching athletes that are not fully experienced in life and they haven't been through as many life experiences and haven't had to work uh, in situations in the professional setting just yet. And they're on a team and getting them to first respect each other. I think that's where it comes down to, because I can respect you, but not like you. And so getting people to understand that just because someone tells me something and I don't like that person doesn't mean that what they told me about myself isn't relevant. Like there's probably some truth to it. Uh, I've found that a lot of times, actually the most truth comes from people that don't like you <laughs> because they're, they want to try to break you down and tell you something that you don't want to hear. Right. Sure. And so, and so teaching the athletes how to remove that emotional response and emotional response is normal. That that's, I deal with that a lot from the mental performance work that I do. So teaching people to understand the emotion for what it is and that it's fleeting. And if we can just hold on for about 90 seconds or so and let that emotion get through and digest what the person actually says to us, that helps set the athletes up to be able to say, you know what, I don't like you, but I'm going to hear what you have to say and I'm going to digest it. And so I think long answer, but just to say that coaches, I think can take can take athletes and teach them how to think through a little bit more logically and see emotions for what they are. Now, with that being said, the coach has to model that, right? So when you see emo when you see coaches just explode in situations, um, you know, that's a whole different conversation, but you have to think, what are you trying to show your athlete here? And does that show that you can work with others? You know, so I don't know if that's relevant, but I just had that thought. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's an interesting thought because, you know, I, especially professional sports, but in general, I, I follow sports pretty closely and the leadership positions are always really interesting to me, how people go about it, especially if you like take when I first started watching sports, you know, 25, 30 years ago to what it is today. And um, fairly recently, there's an example that's jumping out to me as something to what you just talked about. Uh, Aaron Boone, who's the manager of the Yankees, had been under a little bit of fire. The team wasn't really playing well. And his demeanor is, you know, pretty stoic for, for the most part. He, he doesn't get too high, too low. And there are people in the media, at least, and, and probably some fans, who want to see a little bit of fire, like who want to see him, you know, turn it up a notch. And, and, and I always wonder, you know, the same question I think that you just posed, like, it, it, the players got to know that he's being phony. If he's going to turn it up all of a sudden, like he's been manager now for, for three years, three going on four years. So they know who he is. And if all of a sudden he's, you know, being this, this general patent or, um, you know, this real fiery guy showing a lot, of, a lot of emotion, like, yeah. You know, so, but I'm wondering, yeah, you know, I guess like what I'm getting at is how do you maybe change or evolve based on, like need and situation and not lose like who you are or like the, the values that you're trying to teach. Cause it, it seems like what you were trying to say is like, okay, if, if you're the type of person that's showcasing X behavior, then you shouldn't change it, you know, or, or you, or if you're acting in a different way, even um, then your players are going to probably respond to the way that you're reacting um, versus maybe what you had to say about it. So I don't know if I'm, I'm making sense there, but it is, it is something that I, I'm truly interested in, you know, especially as a leader, you know, someone who's 
overseeing a team, like how, how do you, the emotion of sports and like you'll be able to do it all and, and still have your team believe in you. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's something that coaches, and I've witnessed this particularly in this COVID year of playing in the sport of softball. I've seen coaches where maybe in the past they would have acted a little bit different, but because the emotions are running so high. They're back on the field finally. And for whatever reason, they just are at, you know, quote acting out. Right. Um, so I always look at, let's start with the coach. If the coach doesn't know who they are and how they might respond, then they're not going to have any control over what they say or do. They may. And actually, if you look a lot in the research, so then I'm going to put my Professor Cat Pat on here for a second. If you look in the research, uh, in the Smith Small, um, those are the two researchers. They do a lot of coach education, or they did. They really kind of laid the foundation. So, um, really, coaches are unaware of the behaviors that they are uh, presenting to their athletes. And then there's this disconnect a lot of times between what the coaches think they're saying, doing versus how the athletes perceive what they're saying, doing. So that, that disconnect has to be addressed. And so you're starting to see in the field now, mindfulness come through. So we're going to see in the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing a lot of research and a lot of stuff on mindful coaching. And you already see it in leadership anyway. So mindful leadership. And so it's being present in the moment for a particular reason without judgment and evaluation. And so mindfulness is part of meditation for any of you listeners that that practice meditation this should be familiar to you and so what mindfulness just that piece is trying to get at is how do you be present for you and me in this moment i'm not judging the situation myself you anything i'm not evaluating my performance or your performance and i'm completely focused on what you're saying to me and how i am what i am saying all right so it's just very un, unfiltered sense of being. And it's hard. It's hard to do, especially for a coach, because part of the coach's job is to be able to evaluate and judge, right? Performance as is, as do leaders. Uh, so I think getting to the root of that for coaches is teaching coaches how to be mindful so that they can address, well, yeah, I do get emotional at this. And is that, how's that affecting my team? What is triggering me? to be this way? And is it really, am I really being triggered because of what's going on on the field or court or whatever or with this athlete? Or am I triggered because of something that happened off the field, right? So kind of looking at that kind of stuff first. Once the coach understands that, then it's having a conversation with the athletes and saying, this is, and I've actually found this in the classroom too. Once I realize these things about myself, you know, Megan, You've been told this all the time, but you don't want to listen to it. You're intimidating. All right. You uh, show your feelings on your face. You are very direct within the literature. Being direct is good, but I have to, I had to learn how to not be as intimidating with it. So what I started doing was telling my, my um, students and anybody that I was working with just right up front, this is me. This is how I may come across. And here's why it's my coach hat. Sometimes I'll slip into that coach hat and it is just what it is. Don't take it personally. If you have, a, if you have an issue, just say, I'm okay with you saying, hey, um, can you just restate that a different way? You know, <laughs> so being upfront with your athletes and the people that you're working with is good, but you have to know who you are. And so taking the time to get to know yourself that way as a coach or leader, being upfront with your athletes saying, this is how I'm probably going to come across or I realize that I'm intimidating. I'm not trying to be that way. And I'm working on that. So help me if I'm coming across in a way and you're not getting it and it's not pumping you up, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Just tell me and I'll try it a different way. So there's that piece of it. Then there's the piece where the coach has to think in this moment, my team is at like a level four. And I need them hype wise. I need them at a level seven because they're just lethargic or they're still thinking about something that happened and I got to get them over this. So maybe me jumping off the, off the bench and, and yelling a little bit, maybe that'll get them up. And that's stuff that you practice with, right? And you play and you can't do it all the time. If you're 90 
if you're on the, the Richter scale of nine, and every time you jump up and yell, then your athletes are going to tune that out. So it's that strategic, when do I need to put this in? Uh, so I think there's, it all comes back to the coach getting to know themselves and then taking a look at how does my team respond or how does my athlete respond when I do X, Y, Z. Sure. Experimenting. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, you know, the biggest takeaway from all of that is, learning how to maybe tune out some of the noise, the outside noise of maybe like pressures to act one way or to be some way. And just like you said, first understanding who you are and that's going to help you. That's going to help your team, uh, you know, really have the, the best experience overall, really, really great stuff. And, and I think, so you've talked to us a lot about, you know, that identification and we talked about um, maybe reframing, what a what a family culture looks like in terms at least in terms of athletics you know where where you see that pretty often i'm wondering you know in terms of um i think a lot of teams that i work with at least one of the things they're trying to accomplish is like raising the bar of competition within their program so having a more competitive program but not losing you know maybe some of those key elements that make their culture inviting make their culture healthy uh, from from the inside and outside and so I'm wondering from your experience, you know, what are some of the elements that can really help elevate a program if they're, you know, maybe at a, a C, B level in terms of competition, but they want to jump up to be the next University of, of South Carolina uh, softball program, you know, some, something like that. Like, how do we get from where we are to where we want to go without losing, you know, some of the, those key pieces? Sure. So let me first kind of back up just one second, because I think a piece was missing here with the, for me, with, you know, as a coach, if you want to think about, and this goes into the question you just asked too, if you want to think about how do I want to behave as a coach, who do I want to be and who am I? And then, you know, the kind of family approach versus, you know, maybe we're not trying, maybe we don't call it a family, maybe we call it something else, whatever. The key piece here, just like it is with emotion, is you is you don't want to tell yourself not to do this or not to be this or not to feel or experience this. When you try to ignore whatever it is that you're trying not to do, it makes it worse. And so the, the key there is to acknowledge it, all right? So I this is who I am right now as a coach, and I get that. Maybe I want to make some changes, but I can't ignore the way that I'm behaving, acting, feeling, or want to be, or want this team to be. So acknowledge it first. It's just like if I go in and I tell my team, I, oh, we're all going to be a family. And one of your team members is like, but I don't feel this at all. And they're trying to force themselves into it. It just doesn't work. So they have to acknowledge, I can't think of it that way, or I don't feel like I'm a part of the family, whatever. All right. So acknowledge that. I didn't want that to be overlooked. So when you're trying to raise the bar for your team, I think it kind of starts in a similar position is you have to take a look at what are the things you're doing well and what are the things that you would like to be doing. And I'm going to come back to that because there's a simple technique that I absolutely love to use, but it all comes down to, are you focused? I see a lot of teams do this. Are you focused on the outcome? So are you looking at stats? Are you looking at, I've got to win X, Y, Z number of games, that kind of thing. Or are you focused on the process? That's a huge part of it. If you look at these successful teams, successful coaches, athletes, they are focused on the process. You still have these big goals. Like you have your, your long-term and you have your short-term goals and you know that that's what you're trying to work for. And you put them up there, you put them on your board and you kind of map it out how you're going to get there and you focus on the how you're going to get there. So here's this technique. And I got this from, I believe it's uh, Bo Hansen that came up with this, but it's the SBR model. So it's situations plus behaviors equals results. S plus B equals R. And this is a really quick way to think about and to stay focused on your process. So you start with the R. All right, so what are the results that you want to see? You can do these for team goals. You can do these for individual. You can do these for in the moment. Like here are the results that I want to see. Then you back up to the S. So S plus B equals R. So we back up to the S and that is situation. 
what is my situation that I'm in right now? So it makes your results very specific to you or to me. Okay, so here's my situation. Here are the resources that I have to deal with. Here's the time I have to put into it. Here's maybe some obstacles that are coming down the pipe or that I have currently. So here's my situation. Then you identify those. Then you go to the B, the behaviors. What behaviors do I need to implement given my situation to get the results that I want to see, right? And that's where you put your focus. I've identified my situation. I know the results that I want. Now, what behaviors and actions do I need to put in place to get those results? So you become very process focused. And if you can keep your, your eyes on, all right, here's the results I wanna see, or here's the outcome or the goal that I wanna see. Now, what is it that I need to do to get there? And that's where you stay. That's where you live. And if we'll team, if teams will start there and keep their eyes on those small processes, they're small, small processes, then eventually they're going to build up to those big overhauls and changes. And, and I love the SBR. Thank you for breaking that down because so often I think maybe where people get lost is they hear process, but they're like, okay, well, how do you break down the process? Like, what, what do I do? And, and they're not really sure, um, you know, outside of uh, maybe basic goal setting, what they should be looking at. So I think the SBR is a really great concept. And I'd like to maybe try to combine it to something that I think about often. I talk about often when we're doing leadership development. And so this, this could be individual, this could be like a team, um, the, the concept in the in the phrase that I, I always use is we want to highlight your strengths, uh, but we want to we really want to know what your weaknesses are or where the gaps are that we need to fill in. And I just heard Adam Grant actually talking about this, too. So I was like, OK, well, a Adam Grant thinks it. So I guess I'm not too far off. But the way that you improve the most is by focusing on those challenge areas where we need to. Um, in, you know, fill in those gaps, as I mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, I think this is probably no surprise to you. But what I'm wondering is, I get resistance all the time, because people don't want to work on things that they're not good at. They just mm -hmm. want to keep and you can keep working on that strength for your entire life. But if you are not working on your, your weaknesses, you're either going to get worse um, or you're just going to kind of stay where you are. You're never going to be able to, to make that leap, like to the, to the next level. Like, do you know a way to <laughs> motivate people or, you know, maybe have them reframe, you know, looking at their weaknesses or challenges to say like, okay, these are really important to work on. Um, if we don't work on this, then we can't get from this B level to this A level. I, I don't know a, a good way to do it. I haven't found a good way to do it, but I'm just wondering from your, <laughs> from your work, if you found a way to motivate people to focus on those. <laughs> yeah. So, so many things going through <laughs> my head on this right now. So, so, um, the first thing that, that I thought about was, you know, you said you improve the most when you work on your weaknesses and I agree somewhat. To that if you look at some of the best coaches and leaders what are they really good at the fundamentals well they're good at fundamentals but they hire people and they put people in in places that those people true ha their strengths are the leaders or the coaches weaknesses so yes. sometimes it's about being smart and it's about acknowledging i'm not really great at maybe the x's and o's i can think of a one big football coach is coming in my head right now that I'll stay quiet on, but they're not really great on X's and O's, but you know what? You put that man out there on the field and he's going to bring in the money because he speaks well. He has the energy and he knows how to manage the people that he has and connect with his athletes. So he does a lot of the other things really well and he hires good X's and O's people, right? So, so there's that part of it, but but using him as an example is he's acknowledged, I'm not real great. I need to have a basic understanding of what's going on because it's still, I'm the head coach and I got to know what's going on, but I can strategically build, build the program up and work in that team setting by using the folks that, that are better at that. Okay. So then the next thought is, is if people don't see the value in their weaknesses becoming stronger, why would they want to work on it? They've been getting 
getting by, right? So you have to show them why, if they are better at knowing the X's and O's, to use our example, if you're better at using the X's and O's here than or knowing the rules or teaching hitting or whatever, then this is what it's going to do for you. And so you have to be able to show them something that we use. I use this not only with athletes, but I use this with my students and um, I, some of my clients are game officials. I love, love, love working with them. And a really popular tool, you may have heard of it, is called the performance profile wheel. I can share that with you. And so basically what it does is it's a, it's just a, a circle that somebody has created a template and there are circles within circles. So you have like one through 10 on this circle leading up. Okay. And you go around and you start by saying, uh, I'll just use a head coach, for example, give me top 10 or 12 characteristics or qualities that you think the most successful head coaches display or athletes have, you know, or uh, you see an athlete and you want to be as good as them. What are some of these characteristics you think that that athlete has? So a lot of times you'll see time management, you'll see they're motivated, all those kinds of things, right? Then you have the person, the athlete or the coach that you're working with go through and they rank themselves on where do you stack up on each one of these qualities and they actually color up to a line. And so when they're done, you know, they're ranking themselves. Sometimes they'll have, they'll be a two, sometimes they'll be an eight. And so they see this visual gap. All right. Then that starts a really great conversation of here are the qualities that you've identified that, or maybe you work with them on that. Here are the qualities that you've identified. Like if you want to be like this person, you want to be the best in your game or your field. These are the things that we think that you need. You agree. Here's how you rank on those things. Then go through the S plus B equals R. Where do you want to be? Then go back to how they rank themselves and have them circle one to three, no more. One to three of the qualities, characteristics that they want to work on to help them get there. And they don't have to be their lowest rankings. And so it gives you a really great place to have a conversation. Well, you ranked yourself a two on organization. <laughs> Let's, let's talk about that. How might, uh, you know, organization help you and let them lead the conversation. And so that gives you a really great place to start. And then they have to think about, all right, I do want to work on organization and give them a concrete result. And what do I need to do to get there? So that process, right? The behaviors, but here's where people really mess up is they try to make these big changes. So I've got a big gap in organization. I rank myself a two and I think I need to be at a nine, 10 all of a sudden. And it's unrealistic. You see this in uh, work with uh, diets. When people are trying to go on a diet, what do we always do? Well, I'm gonna go on a diet. So starting tomorrow, I'm gonna cut all this other stuff out of my diet and try to eat salads all day, right? How long does that last? Doesn't usually. Uh, or I'm going to do cold turkey on something. Start small. So maybe they start for the next couple of days, they just start by getting up and making their bed. Or they start by getting up and cleaning their room. And maybe they don't do it every day. Maybe they start with just a couple days. So it's small steps that eventually when they look back, they're going to see that, you know what? I cleaned my room and made my bed every day today <laughs> or this week, you know? And so then we start going on to more, um, a little bit more. And so it's baby steps and it does, everything's not going to work. So once, once you get, and you're trying to work on whatever, maybe that weakness is, and you showed them, this is how organization can help you. And you give them those examples. Then it's, um, you know, we tried this and it didn't really work. Like I'm not buying into it. I thought I could do this, but it's not realistic. Okay. Let's find something else that works. And so you're always trying to help the individual. So kind of a long answer, but there's a process to this. It's not, sure. and, and I don't, and I think if you have them work on all their weaknesses at once, you're going to lose them. They're never going to see that, or they're not going to want to work because you're setting them up for failure. Pick one, let them work on some of their strengths. It's okay to work on those strengths too. Now let's pick one of these weaknesses and let's build up on that. And then when we get good at that, let's, let's move on to another one. Sure. So say in a scenario, I hire you 
uh, to be my coach, my consultant. I'm a head coach. I go through that exercise and I've, uh, I've identified, you know, certain areas where I can be better. How do you go about helping wh- whether it's strengths or weaknesses? I guess it doesn't have to be one or the other, but how do you go about helping people prioritize what's most important? Like, is there a process to that? Like picking, you know, you said you can, if you have like five or six things, you can pick like one or two or three, but h- how would I go about picking what those are knowing, you know, maybe that they're going to give me the value or the most impact for my time, you know, given the situation or, or whatever it is. I mean, is it really like that detailed? Like you have to really understand who the person is, what they're trying to accomplish, and then you can help them prioritize, or is there something else that you can do? Yeah. So as in my consultant role, what I do is I help the person, the client articulate, well, why is it that you want to do this? Sometimes what I'll run into, and I actually ran into this, I'll give you an example with a referee. So this referee was um, working some, a power five women's basketball. That's what they were calling. And with a position like that, the more games you get, they actually make pretty decent money in women's basketball power five. And, um, you know, this person wanted to get as many games at the division one level, because they were also doing some division two, they weren't making as much money, but they were doing it. And from the get-go, this person said, well, I'm calling these games because I love to call games. Like, I'm in it. That's why I do it. Well, turns out when we had to make some changes because they just were not happy and they couldn't figure out why. And they they were going to retire soon. So they wanted to go out strong. So we did a little exercise, really simple, that that speaks to what you're saying is, let's talk about here's your results that you want to see. And... Now, why, why do you want to see that? Why are you doing this? Why are you calling games? And so I had them list out, I think I did five, five or six reasons why. And so this person, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, they, they listed out that they just enjoyed the camaraderie. They enjoyed being around the sport. They enjoyed travel. They, they, the money, you know, that kind of thing. So we got all their reasons why. And then I said, okay, let's rank them in order of one to three, knowing that they're going to overlap. What's your primary reason why you do this? One through three. So we cut some of the little ones out. Did you know that when they were honest with themselves, the number one reason why it was for the money. And so when what we know is when we do things for those external reasons, so if our primary motivators are for the money, for the recognition, all that kind of stuff, we are less likely to be successful and to stay in it or want to do it, okay, and put the effort in. And so when this person realized that the number one reason that they were in this to call games was because the money, they realized that they were okay letting it go. And so they retired a year early, not that I'm trying to end careers, but they, they, re, they realized that they weren't happy because they were in it for the wrong reasons. And so sometimes we get shaded and we think that we're doing things for a particular reason when in reality we're doing it for we're honest with ourselves. We're doing it for a different reason. So as a consultant, I help clients walk through that process. So a lot of times up front, because they've got to understand why they're doing things and what their motivations are. And if they find that they're doing things for a lot of those external reasons, we try to find out how can we get you to be doing these things for more internal reasons. You enjoy it. You want to help. You know, you get a sense of value from doing X, Y, Z. And so we try to shift some of those reasons. Sometimes we're able to knock, we're able to knock uh, um, task off the table, like I did with with that referee, um, because they realize this isn't really bringing me joy. I'm doing this for the wrong reasons, so I'm going to shift my efforts elsewhere. I love it, and <laughs> it's so. I mean, it seems so simple, right? Like when when you tell that story, and there was the identification, and then they were just like, "All right, well, I'm I'm not in it for the right reason, so I'm not going to do it anymore." Um, I know it's obviously not <laughs> that easy, but um, I think you know, taking a lot of the lessons that you outlined uh, for the listeners today. You know, taking those those small bites, like you talked about, don't try to do it all in one one hit. Um, you know, I think those are some good ways to start laying a foundation if you're 
I mean, everyone can improve, right? I mean, we're not ragging on people, but you know, we're, we're here to say that you can get better every single day, even if you think you're, you know, at the top of your game right now. And so, um, you know, I think that's the best of the best understand that, that that's why they continue to be the best. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who, who aren't at the highest level and <laughs> you could really benefit from this, uh, Megan before. So we're getting toward the end and, uh, you have given us so much great information. Is there anything that's coming to mind in terms of you know, being really important, something that we haven't covered yet that you want to make sure that we talk about today? Yeah, I would say two things. One is if you are trying to make change and you're trying to improve, take a look at what you're already doing well. So a lot of times you are doing things that <clears throat> maybe you just need to do a little more of or more often. And sure. those good things that you're doing, because you are doing some things well, or you wouldn't be where you are even today. So take what you're already doing well, and how can you uh, embellish those a little bit more to help you with some of these other processes? Um, just a quick example with that, like, and this is a, this is a, a self care one, okay? But I wasn't, I hate water, wasn't drinking enough, so I want to drink more water. And so I was trying to force myself, like, I'm going to put flavor in it. I'm going to drink it at meals, which I always have a diet Coke or an unsweet tea. <laughs> at meals. And so, um, it was unrealistic, but I was drinking when I work out, all I want is water. So I was already drinking water. So what I did is I just bought myself one of those water bottles that has the ounces and keep going, you know, and, um, calculate it through it throughout. And for the last two months, I've been drinking a gallon of water with no issues because I would build off of what I was doing in my workouts and just kind of carry it over. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, so take some, take some of what you're doing well. And then the second thing is, is have some compassion, have some self-compassion. Uh, we're compassionate. Sometimes we are compassionate with others and we say, oh, look, you know, yeah, they're going through a hard time or they're trying and I know they're going to get, why are we not like that with ourselves more often? realize that you're going to have some, you're going to take two steps forward and then you may take a step back or even a half step and it's okay. Day by day, task by task, be present in the moment. Don't judge yourself. Don't evaluate. Just keep on keeping on and keep trying with those little things. If you have a fallback, that's all right. Because you know what? The next time you have to go do that, you're going to improve. Learn from what happened but just try to do it the way you want to do it the next time and you'll, you'll get there. So have some self-compassion. Yeah. I think those are really great items to end this conversation. I know I have already mentally improved my performance, just listening to, <laughs> to you talk today. And I'm sure there are things that I will be scribbling down and taking and borrowing and implementing in my own life. And I encourage listeners to do the same, but thank you so much, Megan, uh, for taking the time today. It, it was really great to learn all about the work that you do and, and how you help others. And um, we just really appreciate it and certainly wish you the best moving forward. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys having me on and it's been a pleasure. Please do not hesitate to reach out. You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Bunning at D-R-B-U-N-I-N-G or email m.bunning at fsu.edu. I'm more than happy to help. <laughs>